not to fail you, like me. In the morning, eight o'clock, this should happen. <laughs> Good morning to everyone. So, is it? I'm audible. Am I audible to everyone? I'm Dr. Shai Kamira. I hope I think uh, everybody is able to hear properly. Sure. So I think uh, today we wanted to discuss that the basic principles of uh, post-operative care when you are dealing with the congenital heart disease, right? So. Of course, this is the topic where uh, whenever the basics come into the picture, things become stuck. And uh, when we need to discuss all these things, it's very important to start from very, very much the time. Or yeah, after today's uh, morning concerns, at 8 o'clock to wake up and to discuss all these things with you, uh, always it reminds me the sentence that, Abhi padai karlo, phir baad isn't it? I think all of you would agree that this is the sentence which we keep hearing from our seniors, our uh, uh, HOD, our co residents, and the parents as well. But I think this is not true. A lot of hard work is required. This sentence is only true for only one family, which is Bachchan family. Who, who has Abhi Parai Karlo, Phir Baad Mein Rayash. But you all have, and we all have to work. Very hard. When a child comes with post cardiac surgery in an ICU, it's a definitely hell out of the job to make the child stable. So, how to make uh, the life of the pediatric intensivist or the cardiologist easy in the ICU? So, first and foremost, thing is that we need to understand the general principles like home spaces, home uh, you know, the understanding of cardiac output. Why low cardiac output happens? When low cardiac output happens? How to deal with it? How to time the patient? How to prepare the patient for the surgery? Pre-operative status of the child, intra-operative uh, status of the child, which both the things matter a lot in taking these children out of the ICU. The post-operative recovery is directly dependent on the pre-operative status, stabilization, as well as intra-operative. So early intervention is very much important. So we need to understand that what is happening there. So how to approach this child? This child has ICU. We are we are coming into the entire life post surgery or uh, without surgery, but we will take the care. So there are two cardiovascular principles we have to understand. We have to have a clean approach to manage the situation. I could have adequate training in this situation. We need to understand. Infection control in the ICU is a very, very important criteria uh, uh, kept in mind, and it's a successful intervention. And there is no parameter of on this ICU. All of the parameters are kept in mind, but we need to understand some of these things. So, the basic principle of uh, managing this children is to have a proper delivery and proper cardiac output. So, often delivery depends on the cardiac output. So, majority of the centers they, they do forget to concentrate on this part and the cardiac output. So, we are going to have a detail uh, on uh, how this cardiac output matters and what are the important things to keep in mind. To maximize the oxygen delivery, metabolic acidosis is the hallmark of poor oxygen delivery that we need to understand. Because this was the so far scenario which we all need to understand that metabolic acidosis again needs to be in great visible signs in the ABC, but now we need to uh, you know, go towards the next scenario which is the first case and which is the next case. Which I'm sure that in the in ICU you guys must be doing it, but lactate is a direct uh, indicator of the issue of the okay? and increased lactate monitoring in all parameters is a sign of poor converting the so, if your metabolic acidosis has not yet developed, if you have not yet anticipated, but your lactate is more than two, and it is gradually climbing up with the other coexisting signs like uh, low peripheral temperature, co consistent peripheral temperature, and not sleeping, and the child is having tachycardia, child is having cold and climbing, the child is having a with an output that is not 
So, so we we understood here that uh, the heart rate, the rate and rhythm both are equally important. Rate is very important for the neonates, and rhythm is very important for all the babies. Uh, sinus rhythm is very important for all the babies who are going to get heart attack. So now I'll give you the example over here. Consider that your child has come to you after two weeks leave surgery. Care. He's basically a new spinal injury and so on. And as if you know that it is atrial surgery, right? So a lot of handling is done in the atria. And many of 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 the time, these children come to the lower sinus rate. For example, ninety to one hundred. But this this ninety to one hundred minute heart rate, we feel that so there are indirect parameters to say that there is no cardiac output. For example, poor plasma peripheral to reduce the plasma output, hypotonicity, the uh, high electrocardiogram, and metabolic rate. So in that way. I would like to, of uh, you know, be have the patient on my board, and would like to achieve sinus rhythm is at least around 120 to 140 heart rate, right? So we will see we will see in the next or in two weeks where they will be presenting to you in infancy. So those children who need normal rate, but rather 10 to 20 percent higher than the normal because they are in the post-surgical stress, so I will not be happy at 90 rate. Rather, I would be happy to pace the theory to achieve rate of around 120 to 140. Hope I am clear that we have discussed all the aspects of oxygen delivery. Uh, First, we have discussed about oxygen content. Then, we have discussed about cardiac activity, which is dependent on heart rate and stroke volume. Now, how to maximize the oxygen delivery? Oxygen delivery is, is directly dependent on the oxygen consumption. So we need to post surgically decrease the metabolic demand of the child, which has to be achieved by the adequate sedation and paralysis units is needed and proper thermoregulation. So the child should not have hypothermia as well, and the child should not have hypothermia as well. And ventilator strategies to upgrade this uh, oxygenation will be respiratory to not allow the respiratory to facilities to have hypothermia uh, not be uh, accepted beyond the certain limits. There has to be a proper oxygen uh, delivery. So you need to understand that what is the physiology of single articulation treatment. Like, for example, in this point, I would like to elaborate a little bit better that if you have done a palliative surgery, like post detachment or you have done a spontane correction or you have done a normal surgery. So, in post detachment cases, if your circulation is 95 after surgery, it means that your oxygen is more than adequate. You want to achieve 80 to 85 percent saturation, but now saturation is around 90 to 95. So, do you feel that this oxygenation is normal, or you are going to update it? You are going to have some manipulation in oxygen. Can anybody answer? Is it interactive? Can I hear you as well? Okay, okay, yeah. So, doctors, let us keep interactive. We need to understand physiology, physiology of uh, the damage which is felt. So, in that cases where you have some reason, like you have uh, residual VAD, in that case, the oxygen delivery has to be optimized in both ways. That's all. Like, for example, if you are having a severe pulmonary artery hypertension, you need to achieve VAD above 100 to 140. But if you have a mutation, make sure VAD is 100 or 125, I would be I would encourage you. So in, in, in that case, we would like to reduce the oxygen. So proper oxygen delivery is very, very important. How we are going to deal with the epileptosis? In the epileptosis cases, we may increase the of fat volume around 10 to 20 cc per kilo, and we are going to increase CWP, which is speed. We are going to have a replacement maneuver. We will increase in steady time, or sometimes if severe epileptosis is there, we have to inverse the IV ratio, which is inspiratory upon respiratory. So these are few measures which we need to take face to face about optimization of the oxygen delivery. So we understood ventilator parameters, we understood cardiac output parameters, we understood oxygen delivery parameters. So which are the independent uh, parameters which can optimize the delivery. So as I told you that if pulmonary hypertension is there, of course we need to have a vigilant eye that those are the very level population and any sign that can be very very well. Those signs of deterioration of severe pulmonary artery hypertension will be sudden change in the lung compliance, 
सीरियल डी सेचुरेशन सेवन लो कार्डियक आउटपुट सिस्टम इलेक्ट्रोलाइट इज प्रोड्यूस्ड हाई वेंटिकुलर प्रेशर इंडिकेटर एंड देयर विल बी सीवियर रीजन ऑन पेंटल कार्ड सो सडनली लंग कंप्रेशन विल बी चेंज दैट स्पेसिफिकली हैपेंस आफ्टर द हैंडलिंग सो वी नीड टू ट्रीट ट्रेन आवर मसल्स इन सच अ वे दैट मसल्स हैज टू अंडरस्टैंड और यू नो इन एन आर यू नीड वी प्रोवाइड देम द विजुअल गाइड a visual guide nowadays in the internet that in your absent also it's a one small exercise which you can put on the ventilator stuff or uh, stick the uh, with the ventilator that whenever you are doing this suction of the child please free of the need for pine to have a suction oxygen use your suction catheter and try to be finish try to finish the procedure as early as possible So these are the few parameters which are very important to convey to your subordinate staff or nurses because nurses are the main player of treatment of these uh, children and they are there with the child. So it is very important to be understand. Your entire team should know that unless and otherwise 12 to 12 to 24 hours are stable of a child with having severe pulmonary artery hypertension or surgery, you should not be jumping around to stop medicine and then get the blocker. However, I would say that nowadays you must be Blocker is a bit weird as it's called. So that decision we don't think in with this new muscular blocker. We don't think in more cases there are at all. We start leaving the children with light blues. So that also blunts the pulmonary artery hypertension process, and which is very important to uh, manage these things. Like for example, large vessels with pulmonary artery hypertension, operative vessels with bronchospheres, arteries, and so on. Multiple shifts in vessels with pulmonary artery hypertension. Very preventative action that we can. In this situation, the target period should be around 7.5 to 7.6, which is a bit surprising that we we usually keep around 7.3 to 7.4 period in normal children with a pulmonary artery hypertension. After hypertension, but in these children, when you have a severe pulmonary artery hypertension, we are starting between 7.5 to 7.6. This year, we have seen between 30 to 35. Zero to three in the India, eighty-five to one hundred. Nitric oxide is very much has. It's a wonderful tool to manage the first two to three days of uh, a post-cardiac surgery recovery, and we usually start with around ten parts per minute for six hours, and then gradually to around three to five parts per minute. And believe me, that this after nitric oxide, the management of this will become very, very uh, you know, smooth, and uh, they, they don't have much of the things that we used to have. However, now other drugs drugs are also available like IV sildenafil. That also people have tried in doses of around one to one point five milligram per day and in continuous infusion of pulmonary pulmonary, and that also can be used when we are weaning the child from nitric oxide and we are in the early stages of that. As I discussed to you, that which are the precipitating events. Uh, Contributing to pulmonary artery hypertension crisis are cold stress, suction, and oxidation. These are the three main things, along with sometimes fever and fatigue, which are another uh, very important factor to cause severe pulmonary artery hypertension. Like eventually, it causes metabolic oxidation, hyperplasia, hyperplasia, and increases the pulmonary vascular resistance. And increased pulmonary vascular resistance eventually reduces the blood flow, going from right side to the left side, left side of the heart. Reduces the LVP load, reduces RV dysfunction level, reduces sensory function level. So it will reduce cardiac output by reducing the LVP load, and it will reduce the RV output as well because of reducing the RV dysfunction. Eventually, it less and less blood flows to pass from the lungs, and it will cause sudden hypoxemia and low output. This is a vicious cycle, keeps going on, keeps going on in a very short span of time, and eventually, you know. Many times we do see the sudden cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac death. It is very much a noxious stimuli, control of the cold stress, very gentle and quick suctioning. If possible, use your suction catheters. Avoid sedatives. Avoid adequate sedation, paralysis, and pain control. And all obviously slowly in the in the children rather than a quick and fast pathway. As I told you, to control the PA crisis, pain control and sedation is very very important. Stress response optimization is required in first three days after surgery because the this kid has limited myocardial reserve, specifically in the lungs. And after adequate pain control and sedation, you will be reducing the metabolism. Eventually, it will help in 
but around you can say the requirement for service of that flesh can be required more pressure. Capillary leak happens because of loss of falsified blood flow, vasoconstriction and eventual phenomenon because of CTB, and renovascular effect of CTB itself would cause a creation of renal angiotensin factor. So because of all the stress, we would have more and more fluid leaking, more and more capillaries will be leaking. We have cytokine because of the your blood gets exposed to the tubing or foreign body. Uh, surgery itself induces cytokine releases and infection itself induces the cytokine release. So these all parameters along with fluid increase in cardiopulmonary bypass induces such an environment where that fluid is going to leak. As uh, explained in the chart, that stress response because of the CTD induces systemic inflammatory response syndrome. Eventually, it increases the microvascular response pressure, and you have seen it in this patient with no infectivity, etc. Also, what would have actual negative effect on the patient. So, capillary leak syndrome again causes one of the it's one of the parameters causing the low cardiac output syndrome. So, what to do? So, how to manage this kind of syndrome? I'm not going to detail the specific measures, but yes, fluid. You should be very, very vigilant about using the fluid. It should not be beyond 1500 to 1700 cc per meter square per day. It is not ml per cc per day, meter square per day, right? So, if you don't want to remember this, like from the boys of the area, very simple criteria to remember is on the first POD, only 50% of the maintenance should be given with a crystalloid fluid. On POD P1, which is first post operative day, only 75% of the maintenance should be given to be given. And from the third day onwards, 10% in increment each day from the baseline on the monitor of the first year where we were, where it should be increased, not given. However, we will be happy to achieve more negative fluid balance rather than keeping them positive. Each and every flush and cardiopunic groups and drugs has to be taken into consideration. Now, if you see one of the chart example which I am telling, is least. And least ml per hour should be possible. Okay, so for example, if you are using fentanyl drip, I would, if your fluid overload is there, try to cut down on 160 per 50 per hour to 160 per hour and concentrate this fluid with the fentanyl. So, as simple as that, at least crystalloid fluid because crystalloids are eventually going to leak from this capillary, fill your capillary and then subside. What about fluid and electrolyte? Uh, Principles: How to increase the volume, intravascular volume, and how to use fluid prevention. It is very much advisable that whenever you are going to use boluses, and if you have a problem with the inadequate preload because of capillary leak syndrome, it should be advisable to use colloids because colloid stays in the intravascular compartment and they are osmotically active. However, if you use fluids, crystalloid fluids, eventually it is going to leak in the capillary. Okay. This reminds me one more. Criteria to tell you that we understood that crystalloid fluids are going to leak. Now, how many people among you do know that isotonic fluid is the only fluid of choice after post cardiac surgery? I am sure that you must be you must have seen many women who are still using hypotonic saline as a maintenance fluid. For example, isolate tea. Isolate tea is the fluid which is nowadays contraindicated. I am using the word contraindicated as a routine intervention therapy. You have to have 0.45 glucose in normal saline as a maintenance therapy because it is near to isotonic and it has less problem of hypernatism. Because as I am telling you, the capillary leak syndrome itself also is going to cause net negative fluid balance. Your intravascular compartment would have less uh, you know, the, the fluid to stay inside. So, whenever you are using fluids, use with proper isotonic or near isotonic fluid as far as possible. Boluses should be always of normal saline, never of 5 or 5 percent exposure, isolate clear half units. You should have only normal saline, even not RL, because RL has high amount of potassium and electrolytes. So, it will again reverse the next thing. So, if you want to give bolus, use normal saline. And if you want to use Colloids, SSP in first post operative is very first operative day is very very important because it has a lot of blood pressure and protein and it would stay into 
or if you want to use check your albumin levels and use 5% of the albumin as five in the uh fat cells are required as i told you that if your hemoglobin is less than 10 for the acyanotic heart disease and less than 12 in case of cyanotic heart disease hematocrit hematocrit has to be maintained adequate and use albumin in only when your hematocrit is normal because albumin is going to draw a lot of clear fluid into intraocular compartment and if you have anemia you would have further aggravation of the anemia because the, there would be because of high color um, uh, the, Followed or oncotic pressures, it would attract a lot of fluid to come back into the intravascular compartment. If your child is coagulopathic, it is obvious. Obviously, it makes sense to use SSG in childhood. Okay, and ongoing losses like in chest tube and peritoneal cavity, frequently we should use five percent albumin. Like for example, I am giving the example of fontan surgery. So if your fontan is having a, a huge loss from the ICD or if you inserted peritoneal dilation catheter. These all tubes also causes protein leak, and if you eventually don't don't see serum albumin levels, which in our center we do at every 48 hours, you would not be able to make them, uh, you know, be adequately seen because if your albumin is less, again your catheter will go leak. So it is very very important to maintain albumin between 2 to 2.5. uh metabolic effects yes glucose is one of the principal uh, molecule which you will be using in the for management of neonatal children as compared to adults because adults you would have more problem with hyperglycemia however in children as their brown fat like uh, you can say that the fat which can store glucose is absent or relatively less as compared to adults so if brown fat is less their glucose homeostasis becomes imbalanced so hypoglycemia is a more problematic stuff in our ic as compared to adults where hyperglycemia is more more issue but on the other hand nowadays lot of data are coming that you should maintain uh, you know permissible hyperglycemia in the early postoperative period as every stress or surgery is going to cause hyperglycemia especially if seen in bigger children so they say that if you want to have a better uh, postoperative outcome of this children with post cardiac surgery need to maintain sugar between 100 to 125 which is called as permissible hyperglycemia you should not have less than 100 or you should not have more than 140 you tightly maintain it around 100 to 125 and if it is more than 140 it is eventually required to use insulin metabolic effects we should never forget a very important soldier in your army which is known as calcium because if you see this figure you can say that every myofibril movement or every action of inotrope somewhere like for example if you want beta food beta agonist if you want uh, alpha one agonist if you want uh, you know uh, the sodium calcium channel related activators or if you want uh, you know the any other inotrope like adrenaline noradrenaline uh, dobutamine this all are ultimately requiring calcium ultimately requiring calcium to have adequate contraction to sarcoplasmic movement of uh, calcium to sarcoplasmic reticulum and to achieve proper contraction of myocardium so calcium is predominant uh, electrolyte which has to be kept in mind so the value of calcium has to be maintained between ionic calcium has to be maintained between 1 to 1.2 so if it is less than 1 you should supplement calcium in the dose of 5 to 10 mg per kg per hour as an inclusion and many centers do believe that calcium is also one of the good inotropes it induces good systemic vascular resistance specifically in cases of uh, vasoplegia or post arterial cyst operations near the surgery where neonates have a low calcium reserve so whenever your iron calcium reduces less than 1 you should always use this uh, armamentarium very effectively to achieve the cardiac output so for doing that it is a mandatory that your abg machine should have ionic calcium measured in each and every abg then and then you can have a yeah. uh, other metabolic effects are dependent on potassium as same like calcium potassium also is required in many potassium related channels to achieve adequate contraction of myofibril to correct the rhythm disturbances because hypokalemia and hyperkalemia both are fatal 
in post operative uh, stages and uh, in our unit we have kept that we have to tightly maintain potassium between 3.5 to 4 less than 3.5 usually we supplement potassium more than 3.5 usually we make arrangement that we reduce the supplement ratio of potassium or we use the drugs like lactic and calcium to uh, bring down the potassium level to from 4 uh, to less than you know 4 2.5 to 4 like Hemostasis is a very important. As I told you, that correlation studies are required in first two days. In our center, we not only protein time and activated the partial neoplastic time we do. So along with CT and APTT, we do fibrinogen as well as do the MR on a frequent basis. So that if fibrinogen is low, you can take a call to give cryoperative because the FST is poor in uh, fibrinogen. So temperature. Along with homeostasis, temperature of the child is also very important, and chest tube to chest tube has to be checked. Now, as whenever we uh, think about the um, homeostasis, uh, always it comes in our mind that tamponade is one of the worst, worst phenomenon you would like to see in your ICU. So it is very important, as is shown in this slide, that the nurse should be trained to milk the tube as frequently as possible. And identify the signs and symptoms of tamponade, like sudden increase in the heart rate, sudden intracardiac filling pressure, uh, high intracardiac filling pressure, like increased CVP, increased LL, LL pressure, increased uh, uh, reduced blood pressure or narrow pulse pressure, which is a little sign, and uh, cold peri, uh, can peri peri peri. So these are the signs which tell you that there is cardiac tamponade, along with the indirect signs like sudden stoppage of uh, drain output. If your drain output is suddenly stopped, and if you have these signs like high CVP pressure, high LA pressure, high heart rate, and low blood pressure, this triad is suggestive of tamponade. Uh, so uh, then the point comes about the endergo organ perfusion. So as I told you in the very beginning of my lecture, that along with uh, metabolic acidosis, like increased base deficit beyond minus two. Is an early sign of suggestion of low cardiac output, but beyond this or earlier to this comes is changes in the mixed venous saturation and lactate anemia. So if your lactate was one and within one hour or two hours the lactate starts climbing up in the next EBG, it becomes 2.5 and another EBG it becomes four, then you sh your team should be triggered that your child is not doing is doing good. And in one of the study studies I have found recently that independent lactate value beyond 5.5 is a marker of impending cardiac arrest in next 12 hours. So if your lactate value is more than 5.5, your team should be triggered and jittery that the child can any time arrest. In this kind of situation, which I not drop to use, I would say that every center should have tendency to do mixed venous saturation. Mixed venous saturation is nothing but saturation of venous blood taken from The line whose tip is posted at right atrial and SVC junction. So SVC RA junction, where your central venous line tip is present, you should take a sample from there, venous sample, and send it for blood gas analysis, and mark that that we in mixed venous saturation if it is less than 70, it means that your periphery is vasoconstricted and there is a huge stress on myocardium. So you need to balance this low, uh, low cardiac output with providing adequate contractility and leucinotropy or vasodilatory effect, which you can achieve either with the drugs like dobutamine and NTG, or a better molecule is like bilirubin and levosimendan. People say that less than six years levosimendan has not yet approved uh, for the use. I do agree with them, and levosimendan should be used in beyond six years cases only. But a good thing is it is a Calcium channel sensitizer. So the tachyphylaxis of this drug is very very rare. It is a potent vasodilator, and it induces a good vasodilatation, which allows eventually good cardiac output by helping the myocardium to perform very well. Similarly, melinone is a very good drug, and many many studies do suggest that the use of melinone in first 12 hours after surgery as a prophylaxis. To reduce chances of low cardiac outputs, this drug has emerged like anything. All the centers are using melinone with very less side effects in short term use, like less than three days, and chances of hypotension is very very rare. With when a dose selection is between 0.25 to 0.75 microgram per kg per minute. Hope it makes sense to all of you. 
that newly known is not now expensive at, at all which used to be beyond before 2007 or so when we used to do our fellowship but nowadays newly known also has become a very low profile uh, drug as far as cost is concerned so 700 rupees of molecule is not that expensive and less than 24 hours use is more than sufficient i'm not going into detail of other reasons of low cardiac output uh, syndrome but we need to understand that cardiopulmonary by- bypass itself is a huge indicator or independent parameter which can cause low cardiac output because of its own inflammatory response myocardial ischemia because of aortic cross and reperfusion injury inadequate myocardial protection and alteration in pulmonary vascularization because of cvd itself or if your surgeon has put ventricular ventricular tomy these all parameters are very much important to ask when you are taking the door from a surgeon or from your anesthesiologist so always have a habit to ask them how much was the cost and time is there any issue in the perfusion what the rhythm was all right how was the temperature gradient maintained maintained how do you feel the lung dynamics are when you are shifting the child from the op back uh, when you came off the bypass what was the myocardial contractility was the epicardial echo was done or not it was done then what was the finding etc etc because as an intensivist or cardiologist if you don't get this idea that how the things were going on inside the ot my dear you would not be able to maintain these children very well in the ic so it is very very important to know and have adequate hand over that what was happening in the ot or what then when comes the patient in your territory you should be always worry about arrhythmia arrhythmia has to be controlled very fast and effectively cardiac tamponade should have a low threshold and early recognition is better because once cardiac cardiac tamponade is missed sometimes it doesn't give time to salvage your child then comes residual cardiac lesion it is very very important to do post operative cardiac echocardiography and to document that what is the residual cardiac lesion for example once pathology is corrected but if you are residual residual pulmonary valve gradient more than 40 of course you are going to have a tough trouble in your ic or post cardiac surgery of vsd or uh, the pathology of fellow repair if your residual vsd left and it is of large significance like more than 2 mm uh, size and it has a, a, a effective hemodynamic issue of course you need to correct it you need to push your surgeon and tell that was this is not uh, acceptable with that with this i think i would not be able to accept this child so it is very important to have this in work and eventually we can get it there residual lesions as i told you that residual aortic heart obstruction and the structural defects like residual vsd or residual pulmonary stenosis after pathology repair it makes a lot of issues in your post cardiac uh, scenario diagnostic data can be exclusive with the cardiac catheter regular studies and vital signs and of course now the eco cardiography gives you all non easy uh, data whatever you want to post study cardiac 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 catheterization is now is very rarely required but yes it is very uh, much gray area when you are struggling for the exploration of this thing child like uh, pathology of fellow with large mass cause and low cardiac output which is unexplained uh, there is a risk of lesion Uh, after surgery but you are not quantifying it you are not able to quantify it very well after surgery or like echocardiography that whether this is more than important or not for then cardiac catheterization of course is very important hemorrhagic uh, regulation as i told you that if your temperature control is not good in icu or in the perfusion is not adequate in or the children can get junction ectopic tachycardia because your surgeon manipulates the tissue around the avi valve in cases like uh, the surgery artery hypertensions uh pathology repair etc etc and then the arrhythmia increases of metabolic demands and oxygen consumption which eventually reduce to your cardiac output so thermal regulation is very very important you have to achieve vasodilatation by rewarming uh, optimize the preload and reduce the offload by using the non and that's how you will be able to reduce the chances of hypertension because vasodilatation takes away your tissue temperature and vasodilatation causes reduction of the temperature now coming to the point of anti cephalococcus prophylaxis like for example second generation cephalococcus this is also coming into the basic of management of post cardiac ic so till so far i would like to revise that initially we had understood before your child came out of the ot that what is the treatment of cardiac output oxygen delivery import after child has been operated what is the importance of sedation what is the importance of paralysis how to take care of uh, 
oxygen content and oxygen delivery how to take care of residual lesion um, how to take care of thermo regulation part how to take care of bleeding how to take care of tamponade and now these all things are not there the issue comes for it as a past how to take care of infection of course we should be very much vigilant about infection control but my dear i would like to say that a routine continuation of anti staphylococcal prophylaxis beyond 72 hours is no more required recommended if you will use every tom dick and harry kind of antibiotics for long and long for prolonged period specifically higher generation third generation syphilis sporing or fourth generation syphilis sporing like cetifine uh, and tetracycline tetrabetan as a third generation syphilis sporing uh, your magnex and all your ic is going to be in the big trouble because the more and more use of third generation syphilis sporing causes uh, esv or growth of esv organism in your ic and down the line after few months you would have completely multiple resistant staphylococcus and so on so dears you have to have uh, you know a lead role in your unit if you are taking care of ic the antibiotic stewardship has to be started from you nobody else can take a lead role in our unit we don't continue antibiotic more than 48 hours despite all the emergency lines are done believe me there is no infection which is uh, overt or in a dever a dever concentrate more on the nursing care rather than the actual use of fire antibiotic teach them how to do cluster nursing not to touch again and again to the child wait for 2 hours when you touch you touch from the airway and oral cavity first wash the hand before the uh, cluster nursing lastly handle the nappy after you handle the nappy and thrown out the nappy go for detailed cleaning and wash if you have a simple protocol of this like in nursing team believe me infection is rare to see in your ic we have less than 5% infection rate in our ic and we are proudly to say that is all because not to use strictly beyond second generation cyclo scoring as a prophylaxis of course if child has developed sepsis you have to use the drug after drawing the culture so we change antibiotic only once we have drawn two samples of blood culture each at least one from the peripheral and one from the central line 2 ml minimum each so you can at least have a idea that whether your child is having an infection with the central line or if you have a generalized septicemia so if you have both the bottles positive from central line and peripheral line it means it is over generalized septicemia but if you have a peripheral line sample negative but your central line central uh, uh, sample is positive it means that you are having transient bacteremia from the central line and there's a time to change your central line so these are few basics of icu that you should not jump on the antibiotics and whenever you want to change the antibiotic there has to be a proper concept that what should you expect which second antibiotic do not jump on the meropenem have a second antibiotic ready which is your second antibiotic as per your unit culture policy so if you are asked your microbiologist he, he or she will be able to give you your nt biogram or nt microbiogram of your ic of last 3 months and they would tell you that this is the drug you should use for your second line antibiotic and third line antibiotic so we always talk to our microbiologist we meet every month twice in our infection control committee meeting and then we decide that what should be the antibiotic for the second line as a routine till the culture report comes this is how how you can have a better unit functioning in your department now effects of surgical intervention as i told you that non bypass and bypass both there is a you know a huge difference in between both them like aortic valve surgeries or coarctation repair you would not have require much fluid uh, titration and all but if you use ctb with longer bypass your fluid titration becomes a major problem you should use modified ultrafiltration technique that i think your coffee should would know it better and Un- unless that modified ultrafiltration technique was not available the children used to come post surgery bloated and completely fluid locked so thanks to this uh, technique through which they are able to achieve negative fluid balance inside the ot itself see that what kind of anatomical defects you are dealing like for example you are dealing over circulation which would be increased blood volume per pre operatively like large vsd large vsd large pd mix lesions etc or if you under circulated like reperfusion of area of vsd is very much reduced flow volume like post atrology finishing scenario so if it is un- under circulated stuff volume should not be a problem but if you are over circulated anatomical defect pre operatively 
giving volume would be a problem so to summarize the entire lecture today we understand few basics of pediatric cardiac intensive care that optimal oxygen delivery is very very important to manipulate adequate cardiac output and hemoglobin by manipulation of cardiac output and hemoglobin sedation and pain control can aid in the recovery and which is the key element to understand appreciate effects of cardiopulmonary bypass and circulatory arrest on fluid and electrolyte management think early that this effects are due to CPB and we need to titrate the fluid very very judiciously tight control of all parameters within the first 12 hours after that time patients may be better able to declare trends that can guide your trends the first 12 hours are very crucial first 12 hours there would be a clear demarcation that which way your child wants to go is he still in the low cardiac output or he has come to come out of the low cardiac output eventually what matters the most is the teamwork if you don't work in team like nursing team is not talking with the doctors junior doctors are not contributing well to the senior doctors senior doctors are you know coming for once or twice in the round only they are not in continuous touch of the patients the results are not going to come ultimately it is teamwork and if you don't support each other in the entire team like cardiologist cardiac surgeon the sociologist nursing team and intensivist team they all have to work hand on hand because these five people of the team team member who are the team member of pediatric cardiac surgery if they don't work in harmony ultimately even though these all five members or six members done a good job by putting the railroad but ultimately the result would be such that rail cannot travel on this railroad because there is no coordination between the team members am i right so hope, hope i have given you the correct messages that what is the requirement and what is the basic of pediatric cardiac intensive care and you have got it very well thank you now house is open for the discussion.